Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steve Zerker. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, watching the show. Every uh, couple of weeks or so, we look at various topics in the Asia Pacific area. Today, we're going to specifically be focusing on Japan and the uh, tourism industry such as it is right now. We have a very special guest with us. Uh, this is a uh, uh, I guess I could say a long-term friend of mine, uh, Professor Tadayuki Hara of the University of Central Florida. Um, he is a Cornell graduate, PhD from Cornell, so uh, very highly credentialed when it comes from, from an academic perspective. And University of Central Florida, for those of you that maybe have not heard of it, is one of the highest ranked, sometimes the number one ranked hospitality school in the world. <clears throat> so Professor Hara is very influential in the hospitality industry. And in particular, he's very influential when it comes to the hospitality industry in Japan. In fact, in my opinion, um, he's one of the, he's probably the most influential person for hospitality strategy, uh, supporting university development, the hospitality programs and so forth. And I can say that because I started a hospitality, a very modest hospitality program at Kansai Gaidai University. And uh, Professor Hara was very, very supportive and very, very helpful uh, to me in the early days. <clears throat> he actually came and visited uh, our campus uh, several occasions and helped us to promote the program. So uh, Professor Hara, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, it's late in the evening. You look like you're in Hawaii, but we know you're actually in Orlando, Florida, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, so what I'd like to talk about in this show you can imagine that just like in Florida or Hawaii, where many of our viewers are, the tourism industry has really taken a major hit because of the pandemic, which has occurred over the last couple of years. So just briefly, uh, the international tourists who um, were numbering well into the many tens of millions prior to the COVID infection has uh, been reduced by 98%. These are international tourists. So it's basically the uh, international tourism industry has been uh, stopped over the last two years. And in response to that, the hospitality industry has laid off hundreds of thousands of employees uh, to try and save costs because the tourists were not coming in, the Chinese tourists, American tourists from all over the world. So the last couple of years uh, has been a rough, rough ride for the tourism industry. So Hada Sensei, I'm, I think that that's not debatable, but do you have any additional color you'd like to add to just how bad it's been over the last couple of years? And you can talk about Florida too, because I'm sure Florida's experienced okay. the same thing. <laughs> well, you know, we have been hit all over the world, no exception, but the you know, degree or magnitude of the damage is a little bit different from one place to the other. And I think for the case of Japan, it was more severely hit than other countries like the USA. Because I remember 2019, there were 31.8 million tourist foreign visitors came to Japan, 31 million. Two years later, 2021, the number went down to 249,000. So it's like a little bit less than a quarter of a million. So if you look at the percentages, it's 99.2% reduction to 0.8% of what it used to be just two years ago. Right. And that can be attributed to, of course, you know, probably people in Hawaii, people in the US and knows that Japan decided to take a very strict self-imposed seclusion a really severe one. For example, I just give you an example, you know, which is relevant for you and I, foreign student. Mm. In America, foreign student were able to come to the United States to study. We have several cases of Japanese students who came to Florida. And, you know, they took a courses and they already graduated. At the same time, Japanese government completely refused acceptance of any American students studying in Japan. So this is just one example of how the, you know, level of strictness is different between the USA and Japan. 
Well, <clears throat> there are, of course, you know, the two sides of the coins. Japan have only, I think, 19,000 deaths out of the population of 100, 125 million, whereas in the USA, uh, we have uh, 333 million and uh, very close to 1 million. I think 900, uh, what was that? 926,000 people dead. So like, it's almost like a two-digit difference compared with you know, the numbers in Japan and numbers in the USA. Right. Another thing I notice is, of course, if you look at the USA, UK, European countries, basically, in short, their policy has been, okay, let's try to control the number of deaths. If somebody dies, they will never come back. They can be infected, but as long as they live, they don't die, it's okay. That's European or American policy you know, in a nutshell. However, in Asian countries, they tend to pay more attention to number of infections. It's almost like, oh, you are infected, oh, that's a big deal. We need to have to reduce the number of infections. The extreme case of, you know, mainland China, they have what they call zero COVID policy, which is really the extreme part. But I think Hong Kong is following. And to some extent, Japan is, or Japan has been taking a very similar policy. Australia used to be. <laughs> However, as you know, Australia announced, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, they changed the policy. They will right. decide to live with COVID, just like American government or European government would do. So mm -hmm. let's hope that have a little bit of effect over the decision of the Japanese government. Yes, I, I, I hope that's the case. There are other Asian nations now that have taken a very strong stance in terms of protecting their population from the pandemic and to a large extent have been fairly successful if you compare the uh, infection rates per capita and death rates in the US and Europe. Asia overall has done perhaps a better job, but the devastation that this policy has had uh, because of the total in the, in the case of japan like you you mentioned just 200,000 people have come in in 2021 as compared to 31 million a few years ago the devastation to the industry the hospitality industry is just horrible right so when you talk to your friends your gm friends or academics here in japan <clears throat> i mean how have they survived well, good question, uh, because I have been in Florida most of the time. Mm -hmm. I have seen what they have done to survive okay. in Florida. Basically, in the USA, uh, the management tend to fire or follow employees. Right. So in the sense that the employee will be left, you know, to the market. Yeah. But when the economy picks up, or let's say the demand side for the hospitality industry picks up. Wow, that creates a huge shortage of labor force, resulted in surge of the hourly wages, at least in Florida. In the case of Orlando, you know, we have students who have to work for the hospitality industry because uh, we require them to take internship degrees or internship you know, credit. They used to work for ten dollars an hour. Now, even you know, unexperienced, inexperienced housekeepers, it's like fifteen dollars or seventeen dollars. So mm. it went up so much. Now, having said that, let's look at Japan. The case of Japan, unfortunately, the demand side didn't pick up as American market did. So they still either they are a little bit behind what had happened in the United States, or maybe they are on their own path. However, uh, I think Japanese government or Japanese people can learn from what had happened in the United States. Because, uh, you know, we remember that uh, back one year ago, it was really bit gloomy, but around uh, February, March of 2021, uh, you know, uh, vaccination started to go around with the senior people. And that was a time that, uh, you know, stimulus money came in to everybody's bank account. And then that money became a kind of a fuel <laughs> to move the economy because everybody decided, okay, I'm gonna spend this money for something I haven't been able to do, which is 
you know, spending money at uh, restaurants for arts and entertainment and accommodation, basically travel industry. So that's what happened in the United States. And uh, I hope that would happen in Japan too. Yeah, I think um, there has been some recovery of domestic travel. I, I live here in Kobe and there's a, a Porta Pia hotel, which is close by. Yeah. Sometimes uh, when my wife kicks me out of the home because we both can't work <laughs> together at home, maybe I don't know how to sense if you have the same problem, but I get kicked out. So sometimes I go over there and um, you know, for the last couple of years, the lobby has been almost empty. But uh, recently there's been a few occasions where the domestic tourists have recovered. And I've heard, <clears throat> maybe not to the same extent you're describing in Florida, but uh, some uh, major hotels in the Kansai area are now understaffed as well. And they're looking for people. I heard that the Intercontinental Osaka, some of the office staff people are actually changing beds hmm. because they can't find people to fill those roles because they laid everybody off. So there's kind of a little bit of a catch up going on now because of domestic tourism still granted there is no international tourism that is a very very promising story for japanese hospitality industry because they don't have any any demand from the foreign businesses their you know demand side has been stimulated only by the domestic demand by the japanese people you know people living in japan mm -hmm. and uh, i'm very glad to hear that they went up i only looked at the numbers of you know occupancy rate in 2021 in japan i think the beginning of the year the occupancy rate was something like a 20 some percent oh, which is terrible. devastating however <laughs> december numbers uh, i think this is a, uh, some kind of luxury hotel chains mm -hmm. december number was Six over sixty percent. Yeah, well, that's a really, really good numbers. Yeah, I've been a, a little drinking. surprised as well that uh, even though we are experiencing the highest number of infections ever in Japan, you know, for Japan is running almost a hundred thousand, which by U.S. standards that's nothing, but yeah. by Japanese standards that's really dramatically high. <clears throat> but yet people are still are uh, traveling and carrying on economic activity. Um, also, uh, the booster shot effort finally has taken hold in Japan. In fact, how does it say just yesterday I got my third shot? Oh, congratulations. In COVID. Yeah, it's very good. So they're hoping to do a million uh, inoculations a day. And if they do achieve that, then I think people will feel safer about traveling and domestic. So that's actually how I would like to pivot right now. We've talked about at least the first half of the show about how bad it's been over the last couple of years and the struggles that uh, the Japan tourism industry has faced along with others around the world. But uh, I'm hopeful uh, that if Omicron follows the pattern of UK and other countries that it will recede here in Japan. And as you indicated, other Asian countries are beginning <clears throat> to open up international tourism. So <clears throat> are you optimistic that maybe 2022 will be the year that Japanese tourism rebounds? Or am I being delusional about this? <laughs> what do you think? Well, first of all, you know, I am a little bit, in a sense, I have a prejudice that I am a very optimistic person, but right. setting that aside, uh, trying to see it objectively, I would remain to be optimistic about surge of demand side for the hospitality industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I tend to put more emphasis on in what Japanese call inbound visitors, which means foreign visitors coming to Japan. Now it's completely banned. However, look what's happening to Australia. I think Philippine government also announced from the February 10, they will open up. Australian government is February 21. Thailand government, I don't remember the date, but it's sometime in February. Mm -hmm. As you know, UK already, you know, United Kingdom uh, took that all the restrictions away. And uh, now I know the American hotel organization, hospitality industry sectors are trying, you know, putting a pressure in Washington DC. Hey, follow the, you know, cases of UK. We don't need any restriction. Omicron is probably more infectious, but it's less, less fatal. Right. It's a very important message. So it's like, okay, this is getting into another kind of influenza. So you probably do not have to worry too much about it. And the most important message is there are no there are no hard evidences that 
travelers are carrying the likelihood of you know infecting the local people higher no there's no no evidences so that maybe is the reason why uk opened up australia would follow and hopefully the japanese government will hear the message well i should uh, probably give a credit to the japanese government the japanese government have been there doing that to do well but it is a voters Japanese people who had been kind of educated in the way that infection is fatal. Well, infection appears to be not fatal. Mm. It is, uh, you know, in a sense in Florida, like one out of four people or even more are infected. So it's like inevitable almost. But the bottom line is, as long as you don't die, you get cured. Mm-hmm. So hopefully that kind of message will penetrate into the Japanese people living in Japan. Yeah. <clears throat> what about the demand side, Hada Sensei? <clears throat> you know, this spring, because of the ban on international students that you mentioned earlier, yeah. we could not accept any students. We had over 400 who applied. This coming fall, we already have 450. We'll probably go over 500 students that will want to be on our campus Wonderful. in the fall semester. So. Based on that, it seems to me that despite the last two years and the delays and the lack of travel, that the demand by international travelers to come to Japan seems to be going up. It seems, I I don't know if you would agree with this, but I mean, before COVID, there were 31 million people who came here and the number was accelerating year after year after year. Now we've had this two year hiatus where everything has stopped. But it seems to me there's pent up demand that if the government, as you were suggesting, takes a proactive approach and begins to open up tourism, that people will begin to come here in relatively large numbers. That's kind of what I'm hoping. Do you agree with that? Am I being overly optimistic again? I know you're an optimist, but maybe overly optimistic. That, uh, Steve, that is a very fair assessment. I completely agree, 100% or even more. Because uh, there, there were some, uh, you know, surveys, global surveys. I think it's conducted by either JTP or the affiliate. Basically, they have a, they had a survey conducted in Australia, Europe, North America. Uh, simple question: After the COVID or you know recession of COVID, COVID, you know, settles down, where which country you direct to travel? Japan was chosen as number one in all these places or regions, Europe, North America, Australia. And uh, they basically, (laughs) the reason is a little bit interesting. The reason they assumed is probably because Japan has an image of clean and, uh, you know, relatively free from the threat of COVID. Wow, it is. I mean, if you look at the numbers, that is very true. But because you know Japan has a very low COVID numbers, you know, indicating a good management over there, people want to travel. Okay, now how can it be interpreted by the local residents? I don't know. So in a sense, you indicated, I agree with you, the best idea, one of the best idea, or I would say best idea, is to allow the foreign student to come to Japan and right. study. Right. We had, for example, I had five students from the University of Central Florida, five that I personally know, who was planning to go to Japan, nobody went. One student was accepted for a master's program at some universities with even Ministry of Education full funding. <laughs> she couldn't go. Yeah. So what's happening now? Oh, she, took, she took a job in Europe and now she is now she is in Belgium because mm-hmm. she is now working for a European company. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, what Japan lost, very, very sad. Imagine 20 year plus student goes to Japan, spend two years, four years. What would happen? Exactly the same thing happens to Japanese student who came to the United States, took a degree in Harvard or Cornell or whoever. You know what they do? Every five years, alumni gathering. Every 10 years, okay, bring the families, big reunions. They will become a most loyal repeater for the next 50 years. Mm. What the best tourism seg- you know, segment. And I, I'm sorry, uh, Japanese 
government or Japanese uh, uh, you know, bureaucrat, bureaucrat didn't pay attention to that aspect, that the foreign student would be the best segment of the tourist, 50 year repeaters. So I suggest if you take 500 students, you are contributing so much because yeah. you're basically creating a 50 year repeaters <laughs> for the next, you know, Long yeah. time. <laughs> and in addition, some of the, I, me, yeah. what percent would it be? Like me, 20% I mean, of the students will fall in love with Japan <laughs> and end, end up uh, living here and contributing to society and uh, you know, making Japan a better country as a result. So also over the last two years, we lost all of those people who could have been here, but unfortunately were not. Well, anyway, I'm glad you're optimistic. So what kind of timetable Theoretically, if you could look into your crystal ball, yeah. let's, say, let's say the Japanese government does open up, it, 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 how does it say, it'll probably be staged, right? They'll begin to allow a limited yeah. number of international, I mean, this is how Japan usually does things, right? It's yes, not going to, we're not going to open up the doors and allow everybody in at once. We'll open the doors and allow every day, you know, 10,000 or 15,000 or something like that. So is that how you would imagine this would occur? Maybe yes. sometime starting in the summer, maybe? Yes, and uh, Steve, let's, let's step in to do it a little bit further. We, let's assume that we are hired by the Japanese government as a consultant. What, they would hire you, I don't think they yeah. would hire me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we will. <laughs> we have to make a combination. So what we do, first propose them, accept foreign student as early as March. Why? The Japanese academic year starts in April. So if they're in March, they can start a fresh year, fresh, no mm. missing any, any period. That would be perfect. So start accepting foreign students in March. And guess what? They can be subject to all the regular rules required for the Japanese coming back to Japan or other foreigners coming back to Japan, which is, I think, for the case of the United States, uh, seven of the 50 states, they have to have six days quarantine, but the other, you know, 43 states, only three days quarantine. Mm -hmm. That's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to go. And basically the rule is if you are fully vaccinated twice or three times, you are treated like a preferential treatment. Okay, business class, go this way. So mm -hmm. these students can come in and then create an impression to the Japanese, you know, local people, normal people. Oh, so foreigners are no any other more danger to us than just the same people. Oh, great. <laughs> then starting from April, May, they can open up the visitors in a limited basis. In which way? Take the case of Europe and the United States. Only those who are vaccinated by the vaccine admitted or approved in the European or American continent, those are good. I don't necessarily name what are the other vaccines, but that's what the European unions are doing. Right. That's why America and Europe, we can travel, you know, basically without any quarantine, as long as you have free for the vaccination certificate and the negative PCR test result within 24 hours of the departure. Right. So, you know, the Japanese government just can't follow what the uh, group of G7 government have been doing. And that's how to open slowly from probably May, I guess. Student, March, normal tourist, May. May. That's mm -hmm. my just ideas. Yeah, no, that, yeah, makes, I, that makes a great deal of sense uh, because you're right. The Japanese school year starts in April. So if the students were allowed in in March, then they could enroll in be a part of that year's group of students going forward. And for example, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, for, for example, I have heard that some of the hotel industry are now hiring in Japan. Hmm. And we do have several cases that American student, you know, with American passport, can work in Japan by taking uh, legitimate work visas because of the shortage in the hospitality industry. That gives tremendous opportunity for American students. At the same time, that gives a very required important labor force who can speak English, who can deal with foreign tourists, or who can train the fellow Japanese workers to do business in English. So it's a win-win situation. So, you know, that is the kind of things which I hope would happen in the near yeah. future. <clears throat>
We actually um, are, we've been continuing our hospitality program now. It's in its fourth year. Uh, and the graduates from the last, actually they they have jobs now and they'll start working in April. Many of them were hired. I was so surprised how to say, Hoshino Resorts, Ritz Carlton, uh, Hilton Osaka, even though their overall numbers are depressed right now, I think the hotel GMs and maybe the businesses themselves or the owners of the hotels are thinking more long-term. We need new people to come in, even if the business level right now is fairly low. So I was encouraged. Seems to me that the hospitality industry is looking past COVID in terms of building. I mean, when you go to Kyoto, you haven't been there in a while, but yeah. the number of new hotels is still amazing how many that are going in. So the industry itself is very pro Japan in terms of international tourism beyond what we've experienced the last couple of years. So, you know, what you have said is very important. It actually underscored something very important. Uh, maybe it's a little bit controversial, but you know, taking the opportunity, let me say, Hawaii and Japan have some kind of similar problems regarding the hospitality industry. So what's a common denominator? Many of the educational institutions are geared, have been geared toward tourism studies or tourism management. Unfortunately, tourism management is not exactly what's required by the industry. So having said so, what you're doing at the Kansai Gaida is a trailblazer. Japanese government is paying attention, I'm paying attention, and I tell them you have to pay attention to what the Kansai Gaida is doing, because that is the first hospitality management school conducted, taught in English. That's very important. And uh, I hope, uh, you know, I was in Hawaii like 20 some years ago, and uh, I discussed this with some, several people in the hospitality industry. What they need is a hospitality management person, They're not exactly tourism studies. So in a sense, you are trailblazer in the market <laughs> of Japan because there are 44 universities with a tourism studies program, but none in the hospitality management, especially in English. Right. So, you're doing well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time for the show. So let me thank you so much for your interesting insights in terms of uh, the hospitality tourism industry in Japan and your optimism, which I share about the industry coming back, hopefully sometime by mid midsummer in, yeah. in that time frame for 2022. And that will, of course, benefit Japan. It'll benefit our students. Uh, it will benefit uh, the industry itself. So in Japan, as we talked about before, the tourism industry was the fastest growing industry and predicted to be the biggest industry before COVID. And I think in the future, that will be the case again. So how does I say thank you so much? It's been very enjoyable. <clears throat> we didn't talk about hospitality education in Japan, which I know you're very passionate about as well. Nice. That'll be for our next show. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.